welcome friends to uh, another of our studies on the fruit of the spirit uh, we're almost reaching the conclusion uh, of our journey as we come this week to number seven of our nine studies i find it uh, deeply challenging just to uh, dig uh, a bit more deeply into each of these topics and i don't know about you but one of the things i find most uh, thought-provoking as I've prepared to uh, present uh, or preach uh, on each of the sermons or, or, or study of videos, has been to think just at a, at a very basic level about the actual uh, meaning of the words Paul is using when he lists off these fruits of the Spirit. Now, I realise that might surprise uh, some of us, but when we think about it, a number of these words can be understood as having uh, meanings that operate at different levels. When Paul talks about the fruit of peace, is he talking about a sort of inner calm uh, and assurance which comes to people who follow Jesus? Or is he talking about good relationships within the churches? Is patience to do with human relationships, with remaining uh, calm, with uh, others in spite of frustrations we might have with them or is it more about a strength to keep on uh, enduring that was needed by early Christians who were being persecuted who were eagerly hoping for Jesus to come back and what about faithfulness which we're considering this week is Paul talking only about faithfulness to God or could this also be a, a summons to uh, fidelity and loyalty uh, within human relationships in case you're wondering, I think the answer in the case of faithfulness is, is both and. Uh, if you listened in to Sunday's sermon on uh, 2 Timothy 1, you will have heard me talk there about how actually we can never really separate our relationship with God from our relationship with human beings. The two are just an intrinsically connected to each other. You know, as Jesus reminded us uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, you can't separate love for God with love for neighbour. Do you remember what he says in Matthew 5? You know, you can't go along to offer your worship to God if you haven't first mended uh, a relationship with someone where there was uh, an, a need for reconciliation. Leave your offering at the altar, go and sort it out, then come back, then offer me your worship. And I think the same thing can be said about faithfulness. In fact, I think you get uh, a clue to that if you uh, look at uh, this week's reading from 2 Timothy 1 in the NIV, the translation of the Bible that we use in SPC, just above verse 6, we find this heading given to us by the translators, Appeal for Loyalty to Paul and the Gospel. Now, experts reckon Paul writes this second letter to Timothy around 64 AD, which makes it uh, along with Titus, probably the very last of his writings, which we still have in our New Testaments. So these words are penned not long before his execution, which happens, we think, somewhere between 65 and 68 AD. And as Paul writes to Timothy, who is pastoring uh, the church in Ephesus, we can feel a real sense of sadness in his words. The appeal for faithfulness that he makes to Timothy operates on a couple of levels. He urges him to remain faithful to his calling as a pastor, to keep on preaching the gospel, to not be ashamed of the Lord. But he also says, don't be ashamed of me. And it's worth noting that when he writes about preaching the gospel, he stresses that it's, it's the gospel I preached, Timothy. Look at verse 13. He says there, what you received from me, uh, keep as the pattern of sign teaching and he later talks of many people who have deserted him it seems likely that what's happened here is that Paul is now regarded as a diminished figure maybe someone who's lost influence is even a source of embarrassment or shame to some in the church and so we find him appealing to Timothy please don't you do the same thing please don't you walk away from me Timothy please would would you be faithful so our first question this evening, is it faithfulness to God or is it faithfulness to each other? Is it either or, or is it both and? As I was saying in my introduction, 
uh, to me, this seems like one of the fundamental questions that lies at the heart of uh, understanding this passage and of going uh, deeper into this particular fruit of the Spirit. Is this about faithfulness to God uh, or faithfulness uh, to people, uh, to a church context? And more to the point, can we really think about one in isolation from the other? And if it helps you to unpack this a bit further, you might also want to consider this. What would it look like, actually, if we did have one without the other? If people said they were faithful to God, but that wasn't worked out in terms of uh, commitment to a church community, what would the consequences be? And vice versa, if our faithfulness was more to a church uh, or a leader than it was faith in God, what problems might that lead to? So why don't you take some time to pause this over, hit the pause button and have a conversation between yourself about this, this first question. And so we come to question two. How do we know when it's right to remain faithful? As I was saying a couple of moments ago in the introduction, a key uh, aspect uh, of trying to understand this passage is to uh, just take on board the extent to which Paul uh, now seems to have become a discredited figure in the eyes of some perhaps many in the early church obviously the very fact of his imprisonment makes it harder for him to to exercise the sort of influence within the church that he would still have had if he was out and about uh, and preaching and then there is the fact that uh, as we said earlier this imprisonment will have caused him to be seen by many as a a diminished figure I'm also speculating here, but I wonder if there might even be on the part of some uh, an awareness of his impending execution, or at least the fact that he's never going to be released from prison. And that causes some people to think of him as, as, as yesterday's man. You know, at one point he was the key figure, but now we move on uh, and, and we focus on, on people who are here and around now. Uh, and so we read of people deserting Paul, going after other leaders, there's this reference we have near the end of our reading, verse 15, to Phygelus and Hermogenes. Paul laments the way even they have deserted him. Clearly people who were important to him in the past and now they've walked away as well. And all of this raises another big question. At the time of writing this letter, it seems clear that Paul was not exercising a ministry regarded as impressive by some. Many people may well have looked at him uh, and considered him uh, a man on the way down, uh, a leader whose best days were behind him. And yet we know from the perspective of history that Paul is now regarded as a leader of remarkable significance uh, and stature of all of the figures who were operating uh, and leading at this point in the church's history. It, it's Paul who seems to emerge you know, above all others, as the voice who is authoritative still to us within the church. And we can think of other examples uh, in scripture of, of a similar pattern being played out. Jeremiah also comes to mind, a figure who was eventually vindicated in spite of so many critics who were around in Jerusalem at the time that he was warning of the possibility of invasion and exile. And in the present, there may be similar stories we can think of, of leaders or churches who went through seasons when they seemed to be losing numbers or, or followers. In some cases, where, where churches were seen as, as, as being in decline, but ultimately the ministry proved to have a longer lasting impact than anyone could have imagined. And there are huge issues which are raised here to do with what it means to be successful, to do with whether or not God calls us to build churches which are big, 
or churches which are, are healthy. And so you might want to reflect on this question now as well. What are the signs to look out for to tell us that we've got to stay faithful to a church? Are there any ever any circumstances when it is better to walk away? And, and what might those be? Why don't you have a think about that in a couple of moments' time? But first of all, here's another voice to offer us their perspective on a time when they saw God at work in a situation where others were choosing to walk away. So um, something that comes to mind was uh, in my previous church, and I know I've said this a few times, my previous church, because I had loads of experiences there. Um, but I remember we had this a really growing um, football academy where we would um, engage with some of the kids on the estate and um, would come and play, for, um, play football and um, be coached in football. And we had a, a really good um, church member uh, who was good at coaching and so on and had, had a few disagreements uh, with the church and decided to leave, but leave with the whole of the young people that he had brought to this football academy. So we were left with just two people um, in this football um, academy and we're, we're being funded by um, a Christian charity to, to, to keep going. And so uh, each week on a Saturday morning, just coming with just two kids, uh, seeing like something to just pack up, but these were something that they, they really valued. This was um, their excitement um, for, for the whole week. So we decided to, to be faithful uh, to this cause, even though it seemed like it was pointless at the time, just having two kids. Um, but to cut a long story short, um, we, we had this um, summer camp which we were partnering with, with another church and there was a few kids that came along and we gave invitations to, to come on Saturday to the, to the football academy and then we started with five kids coming along and then it grew to 10 and then 20 and then 30 and it just grew um, very quickly um, and it was just yeah, God's faithfulness but we just had to, to be faithful to this, to this ministry. Um, we believed in it, we believed it was beneficial for the kids in our community um, even though we've dropped into two, it was very um, easy for us just to pack up and, and spend the money elsewhere but we, again we really felt God was, was leading us in this direction so we just stayed faithful to the, to the task and um, we grew very quickly which was God's faithfulness which was great. the last of our questions in this week's study what's the difference between disciples and consumers and uh, this is a question which uh, arises from another issue we explored on Sunday something which I sincerely believe feel quite strongly is an issue of increasing importance in the church and namely the problem of what I think we can only describe as Christian consumerism that tendency which I actually see more and more uh, among uh, some people to think in terms of what can church provide for me? What can church uh, do for me? And sometimes that works itself out in uh, I'm going to worship at the congregation that suits me best uh, at a given moment. Maybe it means I'm just going to go along to wherever the most popular speaker is. Maybe I'm not even going to go to church, but I'm just going to have a faith which is all about reading the most fashionable books or the latest podcasts. When we posed this question uh, on Sunday, I talked about the answer provided by one Christian leader, Alan Hirsch. He talks about how the difference between disciples and consumers is that you can grow a movement with disciples, but you can't grow it with consumers. Seems pointed, uh, seems tough to listen to that, but sometimes it's the tough comments and the pointed comments where we might be getting close to the truth. But why don't you take time to discuss this now among yourselves? What do you see as the difference between discipleship and consumerism? And as you have that conversation, how might it be just sharpening your understanding of what Jesus is calling each of us to? Why don't you pause, take some time to talk that one over now?
Well, friends, we hope you found this conversation helpful. Uh, in a moment, we'd encourage you to take time to pray for each other. But before we do, uh, let's take a moment for me to, to pray for you myself. Loving God, we bring our prayers before you now, recognising that in you we see the model of what it is to be truly faithful. Thank you that you keep all your promises. Thank you that you are the reliable rock, the one who always completes the work that you start. So model this same faithfulness in our lives. Make tenacity our tendency. Mould us into people inclined to faithfulness and fidelity. Make us friends who stick closer than brothers, companions who don't walk away when the road is rocky. Make loyalty the language of our love in this season of change. Amen.